today we are going to be doing what you know I call question and light and what that is is we would be taking I will be taking so many questions from different people um, those in the studio and as many questions as we can have today I would by the spirit of wisdom answer those questions and most importantly also navigate people prophetically through that um, through the answers that will come deploying the gift of the spirit which is a word of wisdom word of knowledge to get into the art of that answer and I pray that um, this session would be very revelatory for many of us and I ask and pray to the Lord that the secret things in your heart will be encoded um, by the questions that will come and the answers that will come in the name of Jesus. I'd like you to listen very carefully to the questions because you see, sometimes we just um, feel like, oh, it's not, it's, it doesn't really affect me. But I've taught you this and how the, your spirit is a spiritual bank and how you can just keep so many things there that when it's time for you to harvest it, maybe three years time, four years time, five years time, and then you harvest it because it's already in your spiritual bank. And that's what I want us to do today. We're going to answer so many questions by the Spirit. I would answer so many questions by the Spirit. But when your question comes in, I would answer them. Tomorrow, we're going to continue this way as well. But we would have a slight link, maybe at the end of this session, where you can ask as many questions as you want to ask. Career, business, finances, spiritual growth, ministry, you know, marriage, relationship. And we can get a lot of answers. I believe very, I, there's a reason why God wanted me to do this. It came very strong in my heart. I woke up with it this morning. And I believe that it's going to be the answer for many people's 21 days of light. You know, that one thing that you need to do, that one thing that is lacking in your faith will be supernaturally impacted to you through the communication of the truth that will come out from this teaching. So, let's get right into it. So, okay. I'll go for the first person, and that's Mrs. A. All right, thank you, P.S. Um, two days ago, you started talking about offense in the uncut, and you talked about the dangers of offense and how it can shut down a ministry, but um, I think you didn't quite get into it. So, how do we deal with offense? What are the practical things we can do so that um, offense doesn't shut down that's, that's such a powerful question. So, the first thing, you know, like I said the other day about offense, is that offense creates a dent in your soul. It's different from your physical body. When somebody beats you, remember the analogy I was using? When somebody beats you and then you just get flogged and that's it. After some time, you walk away. But with the, thing, the thing about offense is that the reason why people get offended is number one you feel like I put myself in that situation to be insulted so if there is a way the offended blames themselves for that event that happened so there is the blame part that comes and there is also the part of the expectation of the person who offended them but why did this person do this to me why did they talk to me like this why did they act like this to me and so that affects your soul very deeply it's it, it's some, for some people, it literally damages them, their life. Now, how do we deal with offense practically? Because the truth of the matter is, there are certain things in our lives, by the years of experience and our growth in life and ministry, we would have known, codedly, that this thing has come to stay in our journey. For example, you know for sure that if you are a career professional, chances are that at some point in your career, you would believe for another job. You have to start planning now in terms of your experience in that job you are currently, the things that you are doing there, making yourself so valuable in that place so that by the time you are looking for another job, you have a track record of integrity, you have a track record of success, you have a track record that shows some form of advancing that you can now use to present to the, other, to the other organization that you are going to. Am I correct? If you do that with your career, where you put like a trade, a, a, you know, a trademark of your growth in your career, 
and you know for sure that a time is coming I'm going to have to apply for another job and you can strategically plan that then same also when it comes to offense you can plan ahead for it that's the truth you can plan ahead for it you can take a position of truth for any event in your life before it comes you take a position for example one position many people say but will never do when they're offended is the position of once I'm offended I don't make a decision it's a position you can take you can guard yourself with that position it's an anchor that you make but sadly so not everyone makes that position takes not everyone who proclaims or declares that position keeps to that position when you make those decisions which is the moment I'm offended I don't make a decision you've guarded yourself with a truth that truth keeps you going which is the first thing I would say number one when you are offended that's not a time to make a decision truth any decision you make when you're offended is colored any decision you make when you're offended is colored in fact I always tell people that when you're offended give it a lot more time till you feel like you can now deal and speak about it so number one put that very clear in your heart number two how to deal with offense ask yourself what is God trying to teach me from this thing let me tell you something the power of offense is that offense would turn the hand to point at you pardon me to point at them it would be a damn thing they what they did what they said what he said what she said if you turn it around and and realize that every event in your life God is using it to train you into something what would happen to you is that when you get offended by something deeply the first question you're going to ask is what is God trying to teach me through this thing what is God trying to teach me through this thing and once you sit there God is there something you're trying to respond to talk to me about is there something you're trying to say to me here and with the spirit of openness and meekness if you look at it true and true you will see something or a mistake you also made something you should do better and the Lord begins to say make adjustments here and here you make adjustments here and there and then you're able to walk away from that so the second thing like I said is ask the Lord what are you trying to teach me from this event number three once you get offended let me tell you the mistake a lot of people make when you get offended might not be the time to start interacting with the person that you get offended by truth depending on the level of the offense because what happens is that I've seen a lot of people who were exposed to the offense again they had if they had gotten better until that offense offense reintroduced itself again to their lives so you have to by the wisdom know how do I deal with this what are the mechanisms that I need to put in place to deal with this thing for example one of the ways you can deal with offense depending on how matured you are spiritually is that God can ask you to start blessing the person that offended you now that's one of the way God schools men truth now that might be very difficult that might be very tough and there are times what God will require from you is to walk away from that person depending on what God puts in your heart sometimes that relationship might not be good for where you are going through and God is aware about that in fact let me tell you something are you aware that God splits people yeah and the truth of the matter is events is what will happen that will make that split happen now you have to interpret rightly what exactly is God saying and what exactly is God doing here so that's the number three thing that I will say the fourth thing I will say this is one is the most powerful please don't forget this fourth thing I'm going to say you must keep your joy tank full 
all through that process of being offended. Once your joy is taken, salvation is taken from you. Your strength is taken from you. Are you with me? Look, I heard of a man of God, and this is this applies very powerful to ministry gifts. A man of God who got offended and walked away. You see, the thing about offense is that let me let me put it this way. If you go to the aquarium, you go to Germany or you go to Dubai to go see fishes and you go to this big aquarium and you take your phones with you and your wife or your husband is doing videos of you, you left Nigeria to go and look at fish, you know, that you are just supposed to be eating like Reverend George would say, he said, I will not go and see anything I can't eat. No, no, no. So you went there. Now, what did you go and see there? You went to just admire the genius and the beauty of that fish, of those fishes there. What happens is, if you get there, and one of the fish, eventually you just get there and it's jumped out of its natural habitat, and now that fish is on the ground, all you need to do, depending on the class of the fish, is to give it at least one hour. What happens is that that fish begins to dry up. That fish begins to die. Sadly so, this is the same way it is with offended people. When you are offended, there is a, there is a stain or a mark that you lose everywhere you go to. You might not even know. Even from your conversation, I told you the other day about the lady who came to my office was going to get a job from me and I was just talking and the pain upon which she was talking about her ex-boss, the pain, I said, no, I can't applaud this one, never. Because this person has not truly healed from the process of the impact and what has happened to her. So, you have to learn how to heal. The, the, which is the, the joy part there is don't ever let your joy be taken from you. Because every event in your life that makes you question what happened to you there is an event that was attempting to take joy. Are you aware that the devil is not taking your salvation? He just wants to take your joy. Because your joy is the reaper of all the products in salvation. Truth. So the devil just wants to take your joy. Any event that will impact your joy, you're driving, they hit you, it's just to impact your joy. There is no light in your house. There is national greed has broken down. Joy. People are angry. People wake up angry. You don't know. Try it. Go, just go on the streets now. You see, people are just angry. Just wake up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. People are just angry. What is going on with people? Joy is taken away from the hearts of many people. And listen, when joy is taken away from somebody, they want to take your joy as well. They want to take your joy as well. So preserve your joy and preserve it well all through that process. The, fact, the last thing I'll say here is believers, you must learn how to have tough conversations. You see this one? A lot of people don't, they see it as they, look, there's a difference between confrontation and opening up yourself to how you express, how you feel. You have to learn how to have tough conversations. People would have dealt with issues, but they didn't know how to talk. However, there's a way to talk. So you go there, even with your friend, if your friend is offended by you or you're offended by your friend, you must learn how to have tough conversations. Sis, I want to see you. Girl, I want to see you. We sit down and we talk it out. This is what you did I don't like. You did this, you did this, you did that. But people are angry. They didn't buy you birthday gifts. You have offended. Have the tough conversation. You didn't buy me. This is three years on a roll. Are you counting it? Yes, I'm counting. I'm unhappy. The next fourth year is over. And you would have sent the letter to her head. That's the truth. There are things you insinuate the person might not hear. You can be beside somebody and be telling them that, ah, you know, this is my baby that is even coming self, I want to buy a shoe. And the person does not hear that. They just say, ah, oh, this person deserves a shoe. They go to their house, kneel before God and pray for a shoe for you. But you are trying to tell them that you want a shoe, but they can't hear that. And then you get offended. So, you must learn how to have the very tough conversations with people, even with authority. You must learn how to go to authority and have tough conversations by wisdom. That's where many people now miss it. 
because with authority is different in that sense. Do you get what I mean? With authority, you must be able to go to have tough conversation. Look, sir, I know, you know, you know I love you, sir. It doesn't way you land it. It's not sit down. <laughs> sit down. You know, you know, I've been, you know, there's something I must tell you. You have now created more problem for yourself. But with authority, you, you, you land it well. Ah, this is exactly what I think. And da da da. And you hear perspective. And once you are, and you see, once you have some of those conversations, be open to perspective. Once you are open to perspective, you get truth. And that way you have dealt with that issue. For some people, let me tell you the honest truth. The only way they will get closure is if they talk about that matter. Until they talk about it, closure will not happen. But they don't have strength to talk about it. And so it's creating more problem for them. So they are going, yes, offended because they never just had a chance to talk about it. So there's nothing wrong. Go, have tough conversation, point things out. I'm not happy this way it happened. I'm happy about this. Da, 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 da. But say it in the spirit of truth and meekness. And that way you, so, you, you remove yourself from all any offense that can hold you down and can destroy you. Praise the name of the Lord. Did you get something there? Let's take another question. You can clap now. <laughs> Thank you very much, sir. Um, my Thank question. You. Thank you very much, too. <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> All right, sir. Um, my question is, um, how can somebody make a transition from being a faithful worker to leadership? Today we prayed about um, global expansion. And um, somebody, for example, maybe finds himself in Vanuatu and he's a member of the new. Uh, he, has been, he has gone through these 21 days of light, for example, been impacted strongly. But he has no leadership experience, right? And he believes that maybe there's something that can happen. Or even in the workplace, he's a very committed worker. He's the MVP of the team. And then they now make him a supervisor. And then things just tank. So how do you make that transition? Because there are some people in church, members of the team, yes. But if we're going to expand, we need more leaders. How do you make that transition? That's a very good question. I would answer this question in two parts. I will take your question as part B and take my own question while you were asking your own question as part A. Now, a very powerful question. I would touch <clears throat> on transition, particularly campus transition to city. And I want you to listen to this very carefully. I'm going to say some things I probably have never said before. And I want you to listen. You know, I sat with a pastor, and I've shared this story before. The pastor told me this. In fact, that conversation happened in Dr. K's house. The pastor looked at me and said, Pastor Lam, I have great admiration for you. He said, the thing that happened to our own generation, and their generation is about a layer above our own. He said, the thing that happened to our own generation is that our glory was stolen by the fathers. That's what he said. He said, our glory was stolen by the fathers. He said, I remember years that we would leave school and we'll go to National Stadium. Pastor Chris Oyakilome will be doing crusades. 30,000, 40,000, 50,000 people packed. He said, we'll come from campus there as pastors, young ministers, and then we'll go back discussing about the miracles and the signs and wonders. But we got close to this past to these fathers. We got so close that all we took from our proximity with them was admiration. That we would just be talking about the glory and the things they did and the might they did. And we talk, 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 but never for once, telling me this, he said, never for once did we attempt to even try to say what they did is an invitation that we can do it also. Let us even go and attempt to do crusades. He said, we never did that. We were only excited about proximity. We enjoyed proximity. We enjoyed access, but never attempted what proximity brought before us. 
He said, but the difference that I'm seeing with your generation is that yet you are, yes, you have proximity with the fathers, but you are tempted to do exactly in their lifetime what you are seeing them doing as well. He was talking from a broken heart when he was telling me this thing. I understood it. Now, I'll say another story with you. A, a pastor told me, and he said to me, he said, Pastor Shola, he said, I believe that, please listen to this. He said, I believe there is a reason why you were not deep in the system that God chose you out from a system because you were thinking differently. And he said this. He said, what happens to many people is that once they are done with school, they cannot make that mind transition. Look, yesterday when I was talking about discipleship, I talked about the fact that discipleship is a product of two. Your heart, which is your spirit, and your mind. Your spirit is perfect once you are one with the Lord. You just grow in knowledge and grow in grace by doctrines, by teachings, by learning, by your theology, like your belief. You keep growing that. You mature as a saint through your spirit. But the vehicle of comprehension is the mind. The vehicle of interpretation is the mind. Now then, if you find two people, listen to this, God gives them the same word. They heard the same word. Same exact word. You give the mic to A, you give the mic to B. If they've heard the same exact word, the way they would interpret that exact word to manifestation in terms of they want to launch a product or launch an idea, same exact word, two of them will interpret it differently. Why? Because of the faculty of their mind. If one is low in knowledge or low in the mind, that person would interpret it based on the level of his mind. Somebody hear what I'm saying? So what happens to people, because I've seen this a lot, how it takes, you know, a, a pastor a openly said it all. He said it took our ministry 23 years to stop being a campus church. 23 years. He said, because I never, I never could transition. I can I could never transition. You will be powerful, but there will be something there. Something did not happen. And I'm going to touch on it in a moment because it is a very, very powerful thing. So, transition is not with age. It's with light. You can be 50, but you are still operating as a child. Truth. Transition is not with age. Transition is not over time. It will happen. It doesn't happen over time. It happens when you say it is time. Transition. So, for, you know, I shared a story with you guys before how, because it was a transition thing for me. I was coming back to Lagos. I felt like I'm done with Ife. Enter into a bus and start heading back to Lagos. I got to Ibadan. Lagos was the destination. And I came down from the bus. And I took my bags and I said, never, I can't go to this Lagos like this. The fear of Lagos, beginning of wisdom. I, <laughs> I dropped on the way Ibadan. I turned to the other side of the road, entered a bus back to Ife. Because there was something in my mind that was telling me, if you go there, you are finished. You are consumed. Now, listen to this. This is so powerful. Let's use David as a prototype of transition. David was a shepherd boy tending to his father's sheep. In that place, he fought the bears, fought the lion. He had a testimony of victory by his experience in the backside where nobody knew him. So let's assume that was campus or his university or his background. But he had testimonies of victories that were not yet made public. Ah, please listen to me. Yo. Testimonies of victories that nobody celebrated. Chances are, nobody knew the verdict of his testimonies while he was fighting that bear 
and while he was fighting those lions. It was not made public, but they were powerful victories. Now, Samuel came, anointed him as king, and the moment someone anointed him as king, he still went back to continue. Until the day came when there was trouble in Israel and Jesse had to look for someone which is a son to go and feed his other brothers, Eliab and the rest. And so they called David and said, come, take this food, go and give your brother. The assignment is very simple. Don't stay in the battlefield. You are too young for that. That's why we didn't tell you to go there. We sent you to go there to only deliver food. The father cannot be found there. Take this thing, go and deliver food, and come back and go and tend to your flocks. And then he got there. Then he saw problem. And problem attracted him. Because he had seen problem before. Listen to what I'm saying now. He had seen problem before. He had fought problem. Nobody knew that he had fought problem before. Nobody knew he had power to destroy those things. He probably never told anybody about those problems before. It was his own personal problem. Please listen to this. Now, he got before JC, um, before um, Elia. Before he even got there, he started to ask people around, what is the gift that will be given to the person who kills this guy? His brother asked him and said to him, what are you doing here? Have you come with your truck again? My friend, go back. He said, is there not a cause? He went. They started hearing him making inquiries. They thought to themselves that this young boy making this kind of inquiries. Please listen to this thing. Oh. Ah, this thing will liberate people today. Now I see why God wanted me to do this thing. They, 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 ah, who is this young boy that is asking for the gifts? So they dragged the guy and they took him to um, Goliath. Um, pardon me, Saul. I said, look, I fought the bear, so I fought the lion. There is something I know. It was not the sling that I used or the tear of the bear's mouth or one of those things. There's somebody I know. The one who watches over Israel that doesn't sleep or slumber. Listen to me. There is somebody I know. That same person I know. That person I know. That I knew when I was fighting that bear and that lion. Where nobody could celebrate me, nobody could appreciate me. He only just took the testimony of the person he knew in that place, which is the army, the God of the heavens army, which he met in that place. He said, I've fought the blaze, I've fought the lion, I will kill this guy too. Just give me the opportunity to kill this guy. So Saul gave him the opportunity. Put the armor on him. Listen to that. Though. Because in this university, in this place, the way we fight eh, is with sword, with spears, hammers, and all of those things. That's how we fight. Where you were coming from, that's not how we fight. Now, I'm about to fight a Goliath. Oh, God. This is what God helped, used to help me. Oh. This is what God used to help me. Oh. Everybody listen to it. Oh. I'm about to fight a Goliath publicly for the first time that will determine my death or my next. What am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to take the approved weapon of war in this area or should I go back to what I've been used to so he told Samuel, Saul, said look I can't fight with this thing because I have never fought with it before so he dropped it and went with what he was used to fighting with when he was being schooled in a place nobody knew him. Now, he threw the stone, hit the head of the guy, killed the guy. Of course, you know the confrontation that happened. The moment the Goliath went down, the Bible was clear. He took the sword of Goliath and 
cut his head off. He did not take the stone he was used to. Because to remove the head of Goliath, you can't use the university experience. But to use a testament to meet Goliath, to prove yourself that you can do it, you need that university experience. Oh, these people did not hear what I said. That is, look, I can do this thing. I did so, so, and so, and so. You know, let me tell you what I'm trying to say. Some of you have trivialized your standing and believing God for bike when there was bike crisis on campus and that bike came to you in front of you. You entered. That's an experience that is uncelebrated in the backside of the desert. Now you are in the city, you have trivialized that. You have trivialized the experience even though it's not loud. It's not like the army of the Philistines. But you fought bears. You fought lion. That is your report card to fight Goliath. So you have made light your spiritual experiences. You've now made it light. Now you've come into a place and you've believed you've not done anything before. That's not correct. The only difference this time is that when you are going to cut the head of Goliath, you are going to have to use the sword of Goliath. Now watch this. From that experience, after David got his report card and his opportunity to meet Goliath, never again will you see him use slings and use stones to fight. He now became the army that had to go and learn what was first introduced to him by Saul to fight. He didn't stay with that experience because he knows if I stay with that experience, they'll kill me. How many people do I want to kill in a warfare? If I have 1,000 people to fight at a time, how many times do I want to train slings? I'm dead. I have to go and use the technology that they use here. In other words, he had to go to the school. You can't just say David fought. He, he never lost a battle. How did he lose a battle? He went to learn that thing. Did you guys hear what I'm saying here? He went to learn the oppression of Babylon. In that, in, when I say Babylon, you understand what I mean in context. He went, to, he went to learn how do they trade in this place that I'm coming from. The place they trade where I'm coming from before is different from where they trade here. Where I'm coming from before, I can enter around the campus. I can need 50, 50 naira to enter bike. I can visit anywhere in that campus and I say I'm a man of God. But to come inside this new place, ah, Uber is 5,000 naira. There's another level of experience I must gain. So it means that I must update knowledge. The difference here is there might be a knowledge gap that has not caused that transition to happen. You are still fighting with the testimonial that gave you access. That gave you access before the king. Let me tell you my story. When I first got my first job, the only thing I put on my CV were the things I did on campus. We did supernatural acts. Three shows, three venues, one concert. On my CV, I had nothing there. I put the word group. And I explained what we did. And I was able to explain it. How I mobilized people for months. I put it there. HR is looking for what you can do what you can offer. Now, things have moved past a generation where people are asking, some of those tests is just, okay, invitation to screen people out. Now, they are looking at what can this person, what value can this person add to the organization? That was what I put on my CV. So I sat there. The woman who I told you interviewed me, remember I said I worked with um, one of my boss before. The woman was talking about, you know, oh, this person you work with, I like her so much, da, 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 da. The next thing, the question she was asking me were all the things I did on campus. And I was explaining it. She was thrilled. What was that? It was invitation. But you will never find on my CV now the word dance group. Because nobody understands that. I put the word dance group, what is that? Now, I entered. That thing only gave me access. 
what that experience does is gives you confidence that you can face anything but you now have to now reschool yourself in the trade secrets somebody get what i'm saying here of where you have entered into now so the first thing you begin to ask yourself listen to this is my mind frequency does it match what is happening in this new level what is the mind gap you don't throw away completely your stone experience oh, because that thing is an altar that has been built for you you would always remember God that did it in that time can do it again that's why a lot of people transition and they feel like oh especially with ministers they feel like oh you know that's campus thing. and that's a, that's a wrong pendulum people get into they say that campus thing is over not knowing that that's what you are going to the energy from it some of us if we pursue life the way we pursued life when we were on campus we will be bigger than this some of us if we use our faith the way we used our faith where we could not eat and we're fasting and we trusted God to break food with food good food and you broke that food well somebody just came was cooking beans or rice around you and brought it to you and you ate it well even though it was rice and palm oil but you were thankful that somebody heard your cry thank you Jesus and you saw that ah, I don't have money but I'm taken care of now you go to campus you've lost that mentality that there's something that can produce things for you now you've gone to pardon me, you've gone to the city and now you want to buy everything with your money what happened to you? You have lost the experience of the wilderness. You have lost the experience of the backside of the desert. That was not your trade secret before. There were many things you got. How many of your uncles will call you and tell you that I'm, you are going to school? They, you didn't even call them. Are you, are you on your way to school? Yes. Oh, yeah, send me your account number. You know how many people just called you at randomly? Say, send me, your, send me your account number. Gave you money because you were walking by faith. Your trust was totally dependent on God. Now you have become too cerebral because you are in a Babylonian system that trades with cerebral thinking. Now you've lost the totality of yourself there. Because, because there's the there's a middle point. You can lose this part and lose this part. You must stay in the middle ground. So you no longer have any supernatural experiences or any supernatural testimonies. So you can lose both sides because you don't know how to trade with both. David eventually, eventually became the army, the general of the warrior of Israel because he went to learn how to fight with that same sword he said he could not fight with before. He had to go and learn it. But the confidence, listen, the genesis of his confidence to fight any battle in his life Came from the backside of the desert. In other words, God will use that campus experience to school you to be a man of possibilities. It's upon that premise you will now be fine. You will now go and learn the trade of this part, marry it together, and keep working. That's how you transition from campus to city. Did somebody got what I said? If you do what I said, you will see that there will be a supernatural lifting that would help you out pace time and outpace things. Let me tell you something. In my career, one of my, I don't have regret to, but one of the things that I wish that ah, I did, when I was in that organization there, they brought some people from Germany to come and teach us on graphic design. Because I was in client service department and also with the creative team and it was a Saturday and Sunday training Sunday evening training and I was then it was so busy for me you know sometimes I go to work on Saturdays I just, I just said it was a four weeks or five weeks training I just said to myself I'm not doing that training Jerry these were experts people who designs for I mean they were the best minds can they won can lions they've the best minds and graphics in the world coming to Nigeria, I guess, you know, I didn't go for it. Think about it. I still think about it today. If I learned that, learned that skill set, I sit sometimes, even now, I sit now, some people want to do interviews for maybe 
um, CM, CMO for of the organizations and they invite me to sit on those interviews and they pay me well for it. If I sit on an interview to, to at, that, at the level I am in my career, they pay me very well for it. Now imagine if I could do graphic design. Now, the level I'm in, I won't, you won't say uh, 330K that is design. You know, you remove Y, remove Y, bend it like this. And I, won't, I won't even talk to people like that now. Can't you sweep, swipe it? Can the head come down and the head go up? You can't call me for this kind of thing. If I'm going to touch your graphics, you, you must have money in dollars. So I lost the skill set because of time. Let me tell you something. Any opportunity you, need, you have to learn anything now, you are almost 40. You might not be able to comprehend again. Not because you cannot think, oh, don't get me wrong, but because of the things of life, family, child, children, or are you get what I'm saying? So, so some things you can get now inside this thing. Get it quickly. Don't, don't miss opportunities. So you arm yourself so that once you want to fight, if it's sword, you are there. If it's stone, you are there. Let's fight. Are you somebody hear what I'm saying? Make those transitions. Now, let me say something here. Please listen to this very carefully. I know we have people that attended private universities in the new, lots of them, and we have people that attended public universities, federal universities in the new as well, lots of them as well. And those who studied abroad, lots of them as well. Let me tell and advise my colleagues, my fellow colleagues. You know, my, you know ourselves. Let me tell you the honest truth is that, and that's the honest truth, um, the honest truth is that if you probably went to a federal university in this country, you have probably experienced a one year to two years delay by the strike that has happened at least three to six months delay will be your calendar year. It means that the people you enter school with graduated before you, those that went to a private university. Are you aware? This, you can't pray about it. It's just, a, it's just what happened to you based on the level, number one, your parents' financial capacity or number two, you know, your own decisions to go to a particular school. Full stop. Now, there is a conditioning that might happen to some of those people that might not have happened to you. There might be a conditioning of lack that might have been introduced to you subconsciously or consciously by that experience. You have to fight it. You have to build confidence intentionally so that you can fight oppositions and break barriers. I used to use this analogy a lot. If you see a student of a private university, one of the top private university, and another student of a federal university, who is not just a student of a federal university, but is deep into fellowship, deep into fellowship, that religious mindset, Deep inside, if they both see this a CEO of a top organization in this country, maybe one of the big Fortune 500s in this country, I can tell you that that federal university guy who was deep into fellowship, there's nothing wrong being deep into fellowship, don't get me wrong, but I was into that. Chances are that amongst the two of them is the other guy in the private that will go and say hello first. You know that you can over honor and you lose and timidity enters into your life. Yeah. There's a culture of honor that we might have taught that has made people no longer strong in strength. That to shake somebody that is older than you with confidence in, a, in, 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 the, in, the, in the career world, you don't have the capacity to do it. You know why? Because you've just been taught that anytime you do that, you are dishonoring somebody. That there is a confidence that you can exude 
by just your body language. But there is a demeanor you can also communicate by that same body language as well. This is the truth. Fight everything that will not give you an advantage. Fight it. Did you get something there? Now, let me answer me this question very quickly. That leader or that worker that goes to another place must first know that two things was going to happen to him. He's about to be exposed of his deficiency of truth. Or we're about to see that he was truly embedded into the system. Because there were people who, the moment they relocated, their exposure happened. All that covered them all this while was the light of the company, not their light. It was not their light. It was the light of the company. They say, everybody, let's begin to pray. The moment you hear everybody, won't you pray? You will pray. So you will see them fervently praying, but it's a lie. They were not a person of prayer. It was the everybody that covered them that made us feel that that person was praying to. So the light of the company can make you feel as though you are spiritually awake and spiritually high. So that person must first check themselves away from the company that I'm in. Can I truly stand? First. Secondly, that person must determine in his mind that I have seen myself in the vision of this assignment. It's not a, we are just the new making coat and uh, calling creed. Like you have, you have seen the vision, you've married. I know people in this church who relocated to France, Austria, Australia, Canada, different time zones and they still connected even after three years. After services, they'll be sending me a message. P.S. What you said? What you said? What you said? Some of them even to feast and next con. P.S. What seeds do we sow? Where do we sow? After years, that one convictions were made strong. They were not just quoting creeds because we quote creed here. They know this is my home. This is my portion. This is where God has sent me and we are here. Not moved to and fro by what is going on there. Not moved by what is they just focus locked in. Those are soldiers. And those are the ones you build with. They are seasonal people. They enter into a place where there is no denial there. And they will not take up the responsibility. How did the new London start? Pastor Shegun went to London started disturbing my life because he, he believed there was a community there and we had and it was saying Pierre send somebody we're going to make this just do he started doing tribes he started doing tribe meeting Canada that we are talking about it was somebody in Canada that called me Ontario called me and said Pierre I think we can have our first tribe meeting that's the new ha, see you, you begin to say, I came here for an assignment. Two weeks, some people are going to join something else. You say, you don't have to find a place, I have to plug in. That's how they were plugged out. Convictions must be strong. It must be strong. So, that guy has to check his convictions very strong to say, I've swallowed this vision. This is not just creed. I know what we want to do in this church. I've seen the handwriting on the wall. If you were at next con, you can see where we are going. It can tell you the direction of this church. You can tell you for, for, for free. That once we start entering other areas, you know that this is where these people is going to. It's clear. That's the question. That's the answer to the guy. Thank you, sir. So, my, um, I have two questions. Um, number one is it's two in one actually, and this is regarding in a way money finances. So the first one is um, how the increase you are given based on your current level. Then the second one is as a business owner with structure in your business and you pay yourself salary, and then. 
for the career guys it's a bit easy because you get salary you just pay tight on your salary but the business owner you pay yourself salary and but you still get income for every transaction that come in are you still expected to pay tight on that on every income monthly knowing that at the end of the month you pay yourself salary um yes that's the question all right i'll start from the second question on the aspect of tight i promised you guys i'm going to do a teaching on that but because of the 21 days of light i've not been able to you know do a teaching on that so i'm going to do an extensive an extensive teaching on that but let me let me speak on that tight very quickly and just you know bring it out right now Biblically speaking, when Abraham met Melchizedek and he gave a thent or a tithe, and we've said that that tithe there speaks of 10% of his gift. But you see, ah, if I enter this thing now, but okay, let me just quickly answer that question. Giving to God, either tithing or no tithing, it's a level you begin to think 10%. In fact, that can make it very mechanical in your way of giving. Where it can also be a form of transactional method to hook the neck of God in performance. <laughs> just hook his neck, you just choke him. So if you say that 10%, I don't give you 10%, to, I never see anything for you this month. Oh. <laughs> Now, what you do as a business, for example, you can decide that my, it's your own decision. My business wants to give, it's just the same way, started organization, they'll give 5% of all their proceeds in a year to the non-profit organization. You can say 5% of my proceeds as a business is going to my local church. Or, which is what I do quite well, Every time we have major projects in the new, my business gives to that project and I, as PS, the man, gives also to that project. I do that. If the new is going to buy a property tomorrow, which we're looking for, the new, I said the new, my business would give to that and me, I would give to that as well. So you said you can determine how you want to do that. If you want to tight a portion of your business to the ministry, you tight that portion, you put it there. If you want to give as an individual as well, from your own tight, you give as well to that. So that's the first second question. The first question is how do you increase your giving? That's a very, very powerful question. I, I, I realize about giving that giving grows and it's by consistently believing that he that has called you to do is faithful if you are listen to this if you are going to break your giving to another level that act must be an act of faith you have to do something that when you are done you will think again that ah Oh, nice one. What gets me? What gets me? What gets me? <laughs> I'm telling you the truth. You are, ah, uh, no, 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 no. Ah, uh, uh, they try for this joy. Ah, uh, I don't sow this seed. Ah, uh, they try. It's going to be an act of faith. You're going to have to go above and beyond what you would normally do. And once you cross that, I don't know anyone who's given in maybe millions and all of those things. You realize that somehow, you, or even hundreds of thousands, you just put a cap once you've crossed a level, you, you, you just don't want to give below that level again. Even when you attempt to do it, you feel, you feel a certain way that like, I've moved past this thing now. That's how it is. Some people will never experience that feeling in their life. Because all they give is rotten tomatoes. They just squeeze one, one money somewhere. So say, God. The food in their stomach what they've ate. There's no restaurant that doesn't know them. But to give, they don't have that giving grace. Let me tell you something. And this is a danger when you are in a ministry where things happen. You can excuse yourself 
thinking that it will happen. Either I give or not. You can excuse yourself. I give or not. Money go, they go do them. Is it not, are we not doing it? Ah, see, they go do them now. They get money. Money day. And you don't know. Look, you know, just as because we are pastors, we can't say something on stage. Ah. When people give, you can see it in their lives. I won't say more than that. I'll just leave it there. I've said a lot. The same way the Macedonian church had a grace for liberality in giving, it's the same way a group of people can have stingy spirits in giving. They, they are calculated. You are still on the same level of giving for three years. They will soon cut this one now and talk say, well, if you want to be poor, poor for your life. <laughs> giving is a kingdom code. They say God only needs men to propagate the gospel. Absolutely, God needs men. Absolutely. Let me tell you. One day, because they say God only needs money, he doesn't need money. It's just semantics. When he needs men, won't they need money to get to where he needs them to get to? Do they fly there? We just talk, talk nonsense. Do they fly there? They transport. <laughs> they just transport themselves there too. Kenneth Copeland said a story. He said one day he was in his house and he started to feel, powerful story, ah, may God, may God, may God, may God be able to count on you. Yeah. He said he was in his house and he started feeling restless. I don't know if it's Kenneth Copeland or just um, Casey Price. One of them. So he started feeling restless. And he just speaks in the spirit that he should travel to Greece. It's in Greece, one of these countries, shall. So he entered into his jet without a speaking engagement, without a meeting, without anything. Filled the jet and went. Got there, entered into the airport, started walking, said, Okay, Lord, I'm here. And on his way, he met a lady, and the Lord said, Minister to her. Spoke to her, got her born again. And God said, that's what I wanted to go do for me. Enter into his church, headed back to America. And God told him, I can't count on you. Now, he's never seen that lady again. But do you know that lady can be who God wants to use in the community? Well, let me ask you. There are some levels, some instructions you will not hear. Yes, sir. You don't know? Okay, like imagine now, me, I'm just sleeping now. God now say, at four. Go, going to Sri Lanka or Papua New Guinea. This is just to three, yo. Where is the visa to even start with? So where do I start from? God will just, he knows, he, he, won't, he won't offend you. God will not offend you by giving you such instructions. Reverend George shared a story about a particular man of God who had a meet a church, was going to build the church. And one day, he came to Reverend George. The church was, I think they were supposed to buy the property for 500,000 pounds or something like that. So one day he came to Reverend George. Reverend George told him, go to church the next day and tell the members that we are going to build this church together. So he one day built. They counted the offering. After the service, one man came to him and said, Sir, I just moved into the, the church. They are not longer more than 30 or 40. He said, Sir, I just moved into this property, to this neighborhood. I was driving past two because I was looking for a church. And as I saw the church, I came and I sat there. And I overheard you preaching and touching, and it blessed me. And the Lord said to me, This is now your church. Sir, I have 250,000 pounds. 
to add to the building. And sir, I give every other person one week. That's what the man was telling me. He said, I don't want to take all the blessings from their life. So I give them one week. If per adventure, the other 250 is not complete, let me know, sir. I will drop it. And the man was following up. Have they given? <laughs> and they are trying. Have they given? That's how they bought the property. Now, now, if you don't have capacity, it's just something you can do. God entrusts wealth in the hands of his people to propagate his agenda. Truth. Embrace poverty. Love it. Not in the new shell. Because we learn how to abase. We learn how to abound. Oh, yeah. In this church, we teach consecration a lot. It's found in my messages. But that God doesn't prosper. I didn't want to talk about it. Anyway, um, next question. I didn't answer. All right, next question. Thank you for the opportunity for this opportunity, sir. So my question would be: um, Is it possible to forgive by faith, or how do you forgive by faith? That's so very powerful. I, in itself, you've answered the question because forgiveness is actually by faith. You know, there is a level we must come into as Christians. When I was talking about the light of the sun, and I was talking about the king eternal, the king invincible, and the king immortal. You remember that teaching? And I was talking about the largeness of God and how we must begin to see the largeness of this God. That if a God can heal the sick, it can heal someone's heart. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 tells us very clearly that the word of God is quick, is powerful, is sharper than any two-edged sword. It's piercing not only to the spirit, to the soul, and the joint and marrow. The joint and marrow there speaks about the flesh. So it tells us that the word of God can hit your spirit, hit your soul, and hit your body. Praise the Lord. And what that means is that there is a technology, I believe very strongly, in the spirit that if you touch by consistently following God and walking with the Lord, what will happen is that you can forgive supernaturally and forget supernaturally. You might not be able to recount that story again. Even though you are trying to, you just feel like it has gone. Do you get what I mean? Yeah, there's a possibility to that. And it's by faith. Anything that is not of faith is sin. Everything we do in this kingdom is by faith. We forgive by faith. We get blessed by faith. We move by faith. We act by faith. We marry by faith. We get jobs by faith. Everything is by faith. Everything is by faith. I stood up by faith, believing I'm going to stand. It's faith. I sat down by faith, believing I'm going to sit. It's by faith. That's how we forgive. And once you employ that tech, that heart of faith to forgiveness, Lord, I forgive this person by faith. I, I release my faith in this direction. Holy Spirit of God, help me. And you're just making those, those declarations over and over again. Sometimes you just realize that you can't find a trace of it anymore in your heart. The same way cancer disappears in the body of someone, the same way the trace of that thing can disappear in your soul. By faith. Amen. I'll take one last question because of time today. Alright, sir. So I wanted to ask um, regarding, you know, you've spoken a few times about people or maybe ministers of God or leaders talking or speaking to people from their pain. And sometimes people say that, okay, I went through this so that God can help me help others. Right. But there's also the part where you said people should not use their personal experiences or consecration as a doctrine for others. So how do we, how do they balance this thing where it's not like going overboard where because you went through this then others have to go through this and you know sometimes it just seems as though people just feel like okay I went through this these are the steps God took me through and then I think this is what others should do but at the same time how do they not maybe speak from your pain but like you said people have 
different personal considerations. So, what's like the balance? Oh, that's a good question. Now, I will teach on that today in church, where I would speak about Hebrews chapter six and verse one. Our underlining clear doctrinal foundations laying on of hands repentance from dead work um, eternal judgment and all those things that's a generalization of everyone's Christian faith and Christian doctrine and Christian belief if you are a Christian not hiding because it was some cast now under something else you must believe Yes, now. <laughs> you wouldn't know me. <laughs> Don't worry. You will see. If you're a Christian, you. <laughs> okay, let's continue. If you're a Christian, there's one thing we must all believe you believe in the death the burial, and the resurrection. That is the foundation upon which every other thing is built on. Now, you can have several experiences of the Spirit that is tailored to your own life. What I try to do, please listen to this question, the answer, is irrespective of the experience that everyone has have there will be an underlining principle that you must get matured with and expose them to that principle not necessarily the experience because the experience can be tailored to you but this principle can be universal so if you talk about how you came out from a time of obscurity and God broke you through the principles that you participated in, which one of those principles might be forgiven. It's a principle. Exp- point that principle to them as opposed to what, are you getting what I'm saying? So you showcase more of the principle than the stories of the experience. Now, the stories of the experiences is okay because it gives relatability. But at the end of the day, you must also, as a matured believer, put it this way to, the, to them to let them know that your own might be different. And once you can embrace the difference of your own journey, then, but these principles, we might find that we all have to apply them. Did I answer your question? Okay. Sir, okay. Uh, Amen. I love you guys. So I'm not trying to attack you guys, but sir. Have you you caught her face? (laughs) Okay, sir. I've always... I've always asked this question. I mean, there was a time I put it on my status, right? That every time I go to a conference, spiritual conference, church, I understand that in terms of population, women are a lot more than men. But even here right now, right, there are a lot of women more. I'm like, I'm like, okay, see that? Okay, men are providers. They've gone to look for the daily bread. Why is it that <laughs> almost every time? <laughs> Women are like so much more. I mean, I got some responses that, oh, women are supposed to be the one praying. And you know, you touched that a bit yesterday that, you know, me, oh, I'm not going to marry a a head that, you know, is not led by the Godhead. So, my point, my (laughs) question is, so my question is that, is there like a, is there, is there? I'm not going to marry a man that that is not head by the Godhead. (laughs) Okay, so, sir, is there like a spiritual, maybe maybe significant to it that we are not so aware of? Like, why is it that women are always a lot more? more than many a lot of spiritual conferences even in church right and i've asked but i've not is it population thinking maybe okay that's a good question there is a different size to that now even in the bible you would observe a clear pattern of women even more than men even in jesus's ministry you see a lot of that now even though i said that we only just looked at biblical patterns, not doctrine, or what it's supposed to be. So, the truth is, the makeup of a man is different from the makeup of a woman. A man is very logical. Now, if I announce tomorrow, 
that we would be giving twenty thousand dollars each or hundred thousand dollars each to the first 50 people that come for well wind tomorrow you will find 20,000 men here <laughs> women will be at the, they will be queuing they will not even find a room to stay it's like men are very they track importance to things it doesn't mean spiritual things are not important to them but they do that for a woman even in church growth it has been proven that if you have a lot of women in your church, your church will grow. Even with invitation, go and fact check it. Women invite people to their churches more than guys. I say, bro, I have an Which church did they go? I know they go to church. Now, why? Just the go hell. You go just the go hell. They will laugh about it, but not invite the person. They say, you go now hell, you go just hell. Now, what for you? See, your life, your life just, they will insult themselves, abuse themselves, laugh, and move on. Woman will say, no, don't go. Because, you know, a woman is, they have a womb. It's womb man. They're incubators. They carry burdens. They carry pain. They carry desires. They carry visions. They carry hope. Truth. So, uh, women are blessed. Let's celebrate women. Women are, women are, women are blessed. The world, the world would be, would be, would not be fun without a woman. Now, there are parts as well that we have to find balance for men. Sadly, we don't have so many men's conferences, even though we're going to have one in the new this coming year. Um, <laughs> you know, we, we, we need to reschool men a lot about the importance of spiritual things. You know, we, they, we, men sometimes come very laid back, but we also have men that are very vibrant. I'm, I mean, I'm a man here. There are men here as well you know, that, are, that are vibrant as well. So I think it's just a, you know, um, it's an interesting cultural thing, some of which it was pictures and images they took from their parents. You know, it was their mom that is fervent, carries them to, to church. The father just wakes up and eat and cross legs and say, I'm not going to church today and all of those things. And you see that image replicate itself even with the men subconsciously. Uh, sometimes you must also be aware that even maritally a woman is usually ready to marry before a man the, the, the level of their mental capacity is sometimes faster than a man's own they think father they think ahead when a woman finishes school she's done she's ready to get married most women they can get married as long as they're doing NYC and they have a job they can get married you know but a man sometimes always feel like you know I'm not ready I don't want to put another person's problem with my own and all of those things. And that's why they want to be sending them videos, wedding videos, and gowns and shoes and, and rings. And then the man say, you are, you are stressing me, you are pressuring me. I have mental health. It's more time. He has left the relationship. So I think that's it. Let me take one last question and close. This thing is long, Abby. Okay, um, thank you. Thanks, sir. So I wanted to ask a personal question. So um, in your life now, you are a senior pastor. At the same time, you have um, a PR comms agency, and it seems to be doing very well. And you are a husband, you are a father. So I just wanted to ask, like, ma? so I wanted to ask, like, how are you doing everything all at once, and you're doing so well? Like some of us, ordinary nine to five. Emi wa febo. And we're praying for capacity. So. So I just wanted to just ask like practical. Okay, it's, I think it's a very good question. And I, I think I answered it when I spoke about David. You know, the experiences when he was back at the desert. Um, I think I grew a lot of capacity there. But I'll say this, which sometimes people think that it's all about capacity because you can build capacity and still crum crumble. You must be... Ah, should I say this thing? Okay, I'll say it. You must be genuinely interested in other people's progress. Then they will be interested in your progress. You must be someone that loves people genuinely for their progress. Because you see, many of the things that I do, I was, I'm not the one doing it. 
is the people that love my progress because I love their progress that is doing it. That's a, that's a powerful secret. You have to learn how to open up your heart. Look, you by yourself cannot do too many things. You must identify people even before I became a pastor that I can make, I can call for so many people at my disposal, I was still doing so many things that it was my friends that were helping me. Because I would show up as well for them. I would be there for them. And by that, they just, they just help as well. So you can build yourself to become a man who is resourceful and you are a good resource for others. And people would naturally just incline themselves to you to also help build with you. It's very simple, but it's very powerful. It takes time, you know, um, but it, that, it works. I said a lot of things in coded ways here, but I hope you heard it. Yeah, that's, that, that's, that's, you know, yeah. I have every person who started the new the beginning I have either done their joining myself or I did their baby dedication every I was even to the ones that are not leaders that I was committed to it I'm still I think everybody has if I think well now I think all of them has finished so I don't owe anybody any wedding or any any okay well, maybe some of my pastors that yeah and so I'll show up, you know. Uh, when Pastor Larry and Mrs. Shaw got married, I, I was in America. I came a day before the wedding to be there. So I'm, I'm, I'm there. I'm there. I'm there, you know. When Pastor Obi was going to have a baby, the day she put to bed, I was in the hospital. You know, so I, I'm, I'm there. And it's not what I just do. I go out, even from Nigeria sometimes. You know, to meet people. So, so, so you, you, people see your heart. And uh, from the template of that heart, they can transact with you. And not transact in the wrong way. It's not transactional. You get what I mean? They want to, you know, it's just, just, just have a good heart. Want people's progress. And you see how, because you can't use, you know, all your strengths to do everything. That's one. Number two is, Use money to your advantage. You know, I'm not a tourist. I'm not going from Lagos to Abuja with boss. Because I want to be seeing three. I'd have just gone to the zoo and made baboons there. Now, if that's what you can afford, do that at the level because there was a time that's what I could do. There's a time when I'm going to Akure, Akure Church, went that boss, um, I said boss, pardon me, car, we start zooming, zooming from Lagos. Went that girl, I said, hey, buddy, buddy, rora, buddy, pass this side. I don't do that one again, no. I don't do that one again. Sunday morning, I go as if I never went. If I want to go and preach there, if I go on Sunday morning, there's flight that takes me there, boom, flight in the evening, back, or flight the next morning, back. If I'm going to, so you use money to your advantage. You know, you don't, don't use money to save time. Don't be keep just say, say, say ah. Say flight 200k. How much is uh, my weight for my flight? <laughs> is it 50k? Uh, you know what people say? They say I use the many money to buy food. <laughs> you buy food, then you get there, you are angled. You are, you know, I say aboniki bam. They are, they use aboniki for this part, almost half paralyzed because you went to another state. Now, if that's what you can afford. <laughs> It's okay. But if you can afford to fly, imagine. If you can afford to fly straight, why go to Cairo? If you can afford it. So just do what you have to do. You get what I mean? Use money right. And thirdly, find a right team. Find the right team. Bring them closer to you so that they can see how you see and do things without you getting too involved. Find the right team. Bring them closer to you. Give them access to you. 
You cannot be a good leader if you don't give people access. Forget about it. You cannot replicate Jack. You have to give people access into your life. Irrespective of what the outcome would be, you know, people would offend you, people would hurt you, people would walk away. Just the way they would betray. Whatever things happen, but that doesn't stop your heart. Oh. Because the moment you shut down, you have to, your leadership has been taken away from you. Your oil has been taken away from you. You know, because ministry is, is what you are giving to the heart of people. All right, thank you very much, everyone. I hope you were blessed. Um, so the Slido link would be right there on the screen right now. We could even take as much questions here in the studio. I know lots of people had questions in the studio as well. So tomorrow we'll take questions from the studio and also questions physically, praise, um, online, pardon me. So the link is right there. Put in your questions. I'll take in questions tomorrow as well. And um, let's see, maybe after the 21 days, I'll probably just take some time to take as many questions as well. But let's see what the Lord says about that one. Amen to Jesus. All right, thank you very much. God bless you. And I hope you take to heart these things that you've heard and you've learned lessons slip from you. Praise the Lord. God bless you, everyone.